Unemployment is down in Arizona, but not in Tucson. They're having a challenge finding qualified workers. And the land deal between Pima County and Worldview goes to court. Did it grant an exemption to uh, state leasing law? This is Metro Week. Welcome to Metro Week. I'm Christopher Conover in for Vanessa Barchfield. Statewide unemployment figures show good news for those who want a job. But an anomaly affects Tucson's employment rate. We'll have more on that and what local business groups are doing to try and turn it around. That's after a look at the week's top stories from the Arizona Public Media Newsroom. This week, U.S. Representative Raul Grijalva was forced to disclose that his office settled a claim from a former employee. The Washington Times newspaper reported the ex-employee accused Grijalva of creating a hostile work environment and often being drunk on the job. Congressman Grijalva's office issued a statement saying he agreed to the $48,000 severance payout on the advice of counsel. Both parties signed a non-disclosure agreement. University of Arizona graduate students joined a national protest against proposed tax reforms this week. They walked out of classes Wednesday, as did grad students throughout the country. The walkout was in opposition to the proposed changes that would raise graduate students' income taxes. The bill would tax the stipends and tuition credits graduate students receive for their research and teaching work. The graduate students say that will raise their tax liability by more than 400%. The National Weather Service reports November was the warmest on record in Tucson, with an average high temperature of 84 degrees. March and June also set records for above average heat this year. The Weather Service says if current conditions continue, this year will surpass 2016 as the warmest in southern Arizona history. Mexico has grown into one of the top tourism destinations in the world, and the country's focusing on attracting older tourists from Arizona and the U.S. At the Arizona-Mexico Commission in Puerto Penasco this week, Mexico's tourism officials said the country is targeting an aging population with assisted living tourism. Mexico draws about 35 million tourists a year, each spending about $550. For more news, visit our website. Arizona's unemployment figures are consistently trending in the right direction. More people are employed each month throughout Arizona. But as Zach Ziegler reports, one factor seems to be holding Tucson's job market back. The number of jobs is at a post-recession high in Arizona. The state hit its low point of employment during the Great Recession in mid-2011. And since then, employers in Arizona have added more than 400,000 jobs, a growth of nearly 14 percent. The story for Tucson is different. From the depths of the recession to today, the number of jobs in the local market has grown by about 8 percent. Why is Tucson growing at a slower rate than the state? One of the, the hallmarks of the Tucson economy is that we're very concentrated in government activity. Federal discretionary spending began to decrease when Tucson hit its jobs low point and is still about $150 billion below where it was in 2010. Hammond says federal spending makes up more than 20 percent of Tucson's economy. The statewide number is about 12 percent. Federal government activity is about twice as important to Tucson as it is to the state or the nation. Uh, state government activity is also much more important locally than it is for the state or the nation. And that's still true today. Hammond said a lack of federal spending continues to plague Tucson's economy. It's a point he repeated when he spoke with Arizona Public Media for a radio interview in October. And that really, I think, has put the brakes on our growth. You know, it's a large sector of our economy that just hasn't been growing. And that's really been holding us back. Hammond says federal spending in Tucson is growing again, particularly in the area's increasing aerospace manufacturing industry. That, he adds, is a positive because those jobs have salaries that are above average for Tucson, which means they could push growth in the private sector. Earlier this week, we sat down with Leah Marquez-Peterson, the head of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, to get a business view of what's going on with employment in Tucson and southern Arizona. 
And unfortunately, we are still hearing from our members that they're having a challenge finding qualified workers. Even just this morning, I was at an event where they were talking about the number of resumes coming in has not slowed down, but it's as they're interviewing and vetting through the candidates, they're not finding the qualified workers that they need. I know the Tucson Hispanic Chamber has expanded. You're now in Nogales and Douglas. Is it the same story with your members on the border, or is this more local to the Tucson area? I think it, as we've seen the economic recovery in the state, it's been a little slower in Tucson and even slower in our more rural communities. So we do hear about the challenges that businesses are facing as you get further away from Phoenix or Tucson. So it, it has been challenging. Let's talk about the border area. You're now in Nogales and Douglas. You're also participating in the Arizona-Mexico Commission meetings. What are some of the things you're hoping to get out of there for your members along the border and up here in Tucson? I mean, top of mind for everybody is the NAFTA renegotiation that's happened. At this point, there have been five different meetings at the federal level happening either in Mexico City or in Washington, D.C., and we're living that locally. So the state of Arizona, as I'm, I'm sure you've talked about here on the show, is is very dependent on the trade relationship and economic relationship with Mexico. So I'm planning to attend the Arizona-Mexico Commission plenary session that's coming up this weekend. Uh, that'll be top of mind, whether it's real estate or tourism, business, government, I mean, all the different committees and facets of the Arizona-Mexico Commission will be talking about the importance of trade between our two countries. Is the trade more important for places uh, like Nogales and Douglas for your members, or is it equally as important for Tucson? We're close to the border, but we are not on the border, obviously, as Nogales and Douglas are. I think people are surprised to learn that more than 110,000 jobs throughout the state of Arizona rely on trade with Mexico specifically. You hear it more and you can see it more along our border communities. In Nogales, obviously, we have the produce industry that really dominates. You've seen the, the growth of the warehousing districts and so much of the activity and the expansion of the freeways, SR 189, and different activities that have happened there. So it's certainly top of mind. In Douglas, uh, very dependent on retail industries and the community across the border, which is called Agua Prieta there, uh, there's certainly a lot of concern about slowdown or any kind of impacts that NAFTA might have on Cochise County also. So it is the rural areas that will feel it, just not the big areas, Tucson, Phoenix. Uh. I think we'll feel it throughout the state. If, if NAFTA is not renegotiated, is really a win-win-win between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Um, trade is vitally important to the state of Arizona, and Mexico and Canada are our top partners. And you'd be surprised how many engineering firms and companies that work in the mining industry or retail related to tourism, uh, different service companies that are members of our chamber throughout southern Arizona that are dependent on trade. You also, the chamber running in Nogales, a, a startup clinic, if you will, how to get businesses going. What are some of the things that you're going to be telling the folks who come to that meeting? We're excited to partner on Startup Unidos, it's called, or Startup United. It's the first of its kind, cross-border startup ecosystem event that's being hosted here in Arizona and, and between Mexico and the state of Arizona. Uh, it's this weekend. Uh, people can still sign up and attend. They'll be spending more than 50 hours together with business development, uh, business creation. Uh, they'll be working in teams uh, and competing at the end on Sunday to win prizes. So we're very excited about the collaboration and the intent of kind of this entrepreneurial community in getting engaged both sides of the border. Do we know some of the businesses or types of businesses that have signed up yet? We don't, and that's kind of what's exciting. People don't need to come to this with business concepts. They can come just knowing that they're creative, they want to work collaboratively, and, and are interested in a startup uh, experiment or business or whatever it may be. So we're excited to see uh, what kind of businesses come from this, and we'll be able to tell you next week as they uh, participate in Startup Unidos this weekend in Nogales, Sonora. We've heard about uh, some stores and some longtime businesses in Nogales closing down, but it sounds like there's, there is a movement to, to keep building business down there, just maybe different businesses. We've seen some major hits to the retail corridors of both Douglas and in Nogales, and you're right, several of the large stores that have existed for many generations have closed. I think in some cases business might be shifting and changing. You certainly see a lot more internet presence and services. It's something that NAFTA needs to, um, to, to impact and to change, honestly, as they go through this different, this renegotiation. Um, but I think these startup businesses that are occurring in Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, uh, Sonora, will be very exciting to hear about and to see how that might impact that economy.
Pima County and the Goldwater Institute were in court this week, arguing whether a county lease with space balloon company Worldview violates Arizona law. Murphy Woodhouse is a reporter with the Arizona Daily Star who's been following the case. How did Pima County and the Goldwater Institute and Worldview tangentially end up in court to begin with? So this dates back to early 2016 when the Board of Supervisors uh, approved the, the Worldview deal uh, initially, a $14.5 million deal to build a manufacturing facility and launch pad uh, for the, uh, the, the near space balloon company uh, Worldview. Uh, uh, several months after that, Goldwater uh, filed suit. Uh, that's, uh, that, that complaint included four different uh, allegations. Um, the, the most recent case that we'll likely be talking about today uh, was just one of those, but there are uh, four counts at play. Uh, one of them uh, alleges that the deal violated the Arizona Constitution's gift clause. Uh, uh, two of them dealt with uh, uh, competitive bidding for county contracts, uh, and the one uh, at play uh, currently uh, uh, has to do with uh, state law regarding uh, the, the leasing of county-owned property. Uh, Goldwater alleges uh, that the, the deal br breaks state law uh, uh, governing those leases, uh, and uh, the county says that other statutes granted broad economic development powers that essentially grant an exemption uh, to those leasing laws. Before we get into all of that, it basically comes down to Goldwater is alleging that the county gave Worldview what amounts to a sweetheart deal to get them into that property right there by the airport. I think they would certainly use language exactly like that, yes. So let's talk about the count that was in court. Now, this has been in and out of court for a while. We're at the appellate level now. What was the issue in front of the three-judge panel this week? So it's a, a fairly basic question fundamentally. Obviously, the, the, the back and forth has been pretty in the weeds, but the, the basic question is, uh, did a, 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 an economic development law grant counties uh, the, the, the ability to essentially, or, or did it grant an exemption to uh, state leasing law, which, which uh, preceded uh, the economic development law by, by many, many years? The county, of course, unsurprisingly says, yes, it does. Uh, Goldwater says this deal should have been done in accord with laws governing the leasing of, of, of county property. The, the basic argument made by the county is if this new law, which specifically mentions the leasing and conveyance of properties, did not change in any meaningful way the, the, the powers of the counties when it comes to leasing, then that language is meaningless. Uh, the, the deputy county attorney representing the county yesterday used exactly that word, meaningless. Uh, Goldwater, of course, comes back and says no, disagrees there, but says that economic development, uh, pursuing economic development deals is not incompatible with following the leasing law. When it comes to the questions that we're looking at now, uh, specifically in court, Worldview is at the center of it, a technology company, something the county wants, but it's really a much larger issue. It's not an issue with Worldview per se. Certainly. Uh, if if uh, the county were to uh, to lose, uh, really on any of these counts, and the, and the deal were to be overturned, uh, that could really change the way the county pursues uh, economic development. Uh, in, in this particular uh, case, we have a situation in which uh, uh, the county, uh, it's, it's county owned land and then the county itself debt financed the construction of, of, of the facilities in question. If they lose the case, that means of, of, of approaching development presumably would be, uh, would be off the table. And I, I think the county would say that uh, they would be at a distinct disadvantage uh, against other uh, other counties and cities across the country, which are pursuing comparable deals. And we've seen this before. Worldview is not the first to get this type of deal. We've seen these before, correct? Yeah, yeah I mean, e economic incentive uh, uh, packages uh, have been, you know, we're, we're seeing this at the local level, state level, uh, nationwide, and certainly most prominently with, with Amazon most recently. Uh, cities and in, in, uh, cities, counties and states trying to attract uh, uh, major employers, uh, it, it, is, it is quite cutthroat competition. You said there are four points here. Um, we're dealing with one, the leasing law at this point. What's, uh, what's our court history on this? Uh, how does the county look? Can we win this? Is Goldwater going to win this? Uh, what's it look like? 
So I am, uh, let me preface this by saying I'm certainly not an attorney. Um, I, I think I have a decent grasp of, of, of the basic uh, 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 conflict back and forth. Uh, what I will say is uh, there does appear to be at least one judge among the three uh, that is uh, seemingly in favor of the county's basic argument. There is a draft opinion that has been released to both parties. Its authorship was not divulged to the parties. I don't know which of the three judges wrote it, uh, but uh, uh, Jim Manley, who's the, the lead attorney for Goldwater uh, on the suit, told me yesterday after, after the proceeding that that, again, draft opinion uh, uh, does not go their way. Uh, just to be clear, uh, the draft opinion could be I mean, it's, it's a three-judge panel, right? And we have a single judge weighing in at this point. Uh, it could get reversed. There could be a, uh, it could be upheld with a dissent. It could go any number of ways. Um, but at, at least at the outset, um, signs are certainly more favorable for the county at this point. What about the other three points of the Goldwater lawsuit? As you said, there were four. We only have dealt with one in court uh, this week. We have all these others. Where are they in the court system? Yeah, there are lots of moving parts with this case. It's kind of hard to uh, keep it all straight. Uh, the uh, Probably the most interesting of the remaining three is the, the gift clause uh, allegations. So, so the, the gift clause specifically prohibits uh, public bodies from granting their uh, their credit or, or or financial resources to the aid of, of, of private bodies. That count is currently on hold uh, per an agreement between the between the parties pending the outcome of the current appeal. Uh, the other two uh, counts the, uh, regarding uh, competitive bidding for, uh, for the actual you know, design and construction of the project, uh, those, those are proceeding. The, the, the county uh, uh, had put in a motion uh, uh, to, uh, for summary judgment on those to essentially have them uh, dismissed. Uh, Superior Court Judge Catherine Woods uh, denied that, I believe in August of this year. So those are still very much live and there will eventually be a ruling on them. Uh, so, so yeah, we have one at the uh, appellate level, we have two still live in Superior Court and we have a fourth currently stayed. So there's, it's very active on all fronts. If the county ends up losing all of this, Worldview and the county went ahead and built out. Worldview's launching balloons. This is a business that's active. What could potentially happen if the county and therefore Worldview lose this? So I, I, again, I'm going to preface saying I'm, I'm not an attorney, uh, but uh, you, you are right to point out that you know the building was completed uh, late last year. Uh, it has been occupied for basically all of this year. They had recently a successful launch at the facility proper. Uh, they, you know, very famously. Uh, launched some chicken into space uh, before that from a, a chicken another sandwich. Yeah. A chicken sandwich. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's not really clear how you resolve that issue. And in fact, uh, that was exactly the argument the county made uh, in trying to have uh, two of the charges dismissed, saying, what is the relief here? If you guys win, what do we even do? We can't unbid a contract that is done, essentially. Uh, there was some back and forth about whether, in fact, the, it had been completed uh, entirely, but it is, by all accounts, a functioning facility, uh, housing, uh, you know, uh, a company with active contracts. And to help people understand, this uh, property is out by the airport, uh, kind of in the Raytheon yep. airport complex, and this is where they're putting in the new roads and extending the roads. This is part of a a big county development area for tech businesses. Absolutely. So this is why it's about more than just worldview. We can see more of these deals. Certainly, and and uh, and a loss for the county would 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 obviously uh, you know cut off this mean this this approach to uh, to economic development. Of course, Goldwater would come right back and say, as it stands, uh, the, the 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 leasing law is not incompatible with this economic development law. You can. I mean, so, so specifically the leasing law requires that a, an appraisal be carried out on the property, that an open and public auction be conducted, that it be awarded to the highest bidder, and that the, uh, the, the, the rental price be at least 90% uh, of, of the valuation. And Goldwater says 90%, that sounds like a 10% discount, which for a sizable property is not nothing. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, they would say you have plenty of tools at your disposal as it stands without uh, what they feel is an improper uh, interpretation of uh, economic development law. In recent weeks, sexual harassment allegations have dominated the news cycle. 
men in media, Hollywood, and Capitol Hill have been accused of inappropriate behavior at work. This week, Congressman Raul Grijalva was accused of creating a hostile work environment. Though to be clear, the Southern Arizona Democrat was not accused of sexual harassment. A former staffer who worked for him for three months accused Congressman Grijalva of creating a hostile work environment and being frequently intoxicated. He acknowledged paying a $48,000 severance settlement with the former employee. Both parties signed a non-disclosure agreement, so staff members say neither they nor the congressman can talk about the accusations or the settlement. Representative Grijalva said in a statement that the money for the payout came from his committee's operating budget. He's the ranking member of the House Natural Resources Committee. In the days before the accusations became public, we sat down with Congressman Grijalva to talk about other issues facing the federal government. Let's talk a little bit about the climate in Washington, um, starting with what is very often the headline in a lot of places right now, um, sexual harassment. Uh, Senator Franken now has a couple of allegations. Of course, we have Roy Moore in Alabama. What's the climate like regarding all of this around the Capitol? We're not there, so we only hear headlines and things like that. Are, are members talking about this and trying to well, figure out what's going on? I think Ryan indicated, and I, 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 I think he's right, mandatory uh, training and, uh, and sessions for all, not just for members and staffs regarding the issue of sexual harassment and, and discrimination, absolutely. But once the Weinstein thing burst, and then other prominent figures, both in, both in entertainment and otherwise, and then the political thing broke with more, uh, that I think it's not going to be a drip, drip, drip. It's going to be a, uh, a flood, and justifiably so. And, and I think the old excuses of, well, automatically not give any any veracity to what the woman is saying, I think those times are over. And, and I think not only do we have to train, but do we have to have a response system that fully investigates and fully, uh, if there's punitive actions to be taken, including uh, uh, the consequence of an elected official doing that, his position, then that has to be looked at. That has to be part and parcel, because just to train and to talk about it, give lip service to it, and not putting consequences behind it, uh, I don't th uh, that doesn't get us even halfway. But we're in a, we're at a time right now with regard to, uh, to the issue of sexual harassment uh, that I, uh, that issue is broken. It is no longer a, a secret that a woman keeps to herself out of whatever personal reasons or, or pressure not to say anything. Those times are over. And I, I think Congress and elected officials have to accommodate that. The talk among colleagues is muted. And I, I think that it's uh, perhaps for many it's the fear of the unknown. But we know that this is wrong. We know that there has to be consequences to it. And we know that people in the highest positions and their staffs uh, must be held accountable for it. Congressman Grijalva voted against the tax reform bill in the House. He said he didn't like the rush process. He said it increases the deficit and doesn't do enough to help the middle class. Beyond taxes, Congressman Grijalva says there are some must-do bills before the end of the year. You have a continuing resolution on the budget. Uh, it, that ends December 8th. Uh, Ryan spoke about a two-week continuance so they could finish the tax. That is a must-do. And attached to that is uh, sequestration. Attached to that is DACA. Attached, attached to that is the disaster relief, now in particular for Puerto Rico. And so those are, that's going to carry its own burden as we go forward. Uh, and not real clear as to how they want to handle those issues yet. I think that they're on the environment side, they're going to, there's going to be a big push on the Antiquities Act, how to restrict it, limit it, uh, and give states power over, uh, over federal lands. I think there's going to be a big push about uh, taking back regulatory controls and public processes in terms of allowing uh, more unencumbered 
unregulated uh, drilling for oil, gas, and mining uh, on public lands. We've heard talk uh, here in Arizona about questions on children's health funding, uh, community hospital funding, things like that, uh, that didn't get taken care of. Uh, everybody seems to have money through the end of the year, but the end of the year, as we know, is rapidly approaching. Is there going to be any movement on that? Even Governor Ducey talked about it, especially the children's health funding. Yeah, the ship is, is, is critical for the state. and. Uh, Right now, there is no movement on that or, or any indication of at least keeping the flat funding going, not just this year, this year so into the next year. The other issue I think that's important is, uh, is the, you know, Trump has said that we, we want to uh, lessen the subsidy around Medicaid, the impact on hospital facilities here, disproportionate care for hospitals that take care of uncompensated care in, this commu in these communities. That is not being talked about. Congressman Grijalva has not officially said he's running for re-election. We asked him about that. Of course, that was before the hostile workplace allegations became public. You're obviously in the minority party. I also recently saw a statistic from 538, the website, that said you voted with President Trump 9.8% of the time. Um, do you feel the frustration for example, that even Senator Flake is feeling, and do you ever think, you know what, I've done this long enough, I've made my mark, that's it, I'm following Senator Flake and not running? No, I think, I think uh, I'm going to run with the expectation, the hope, the anticipation that uh, there'll be an opportunity, and I have, a, I have a lot of faith in them and the decency of the American people overall. They're, they're, it's a self-correcting democracy that we have. And the aberration that we're going through right now is going to get corrected. Uh, I hope sooner than later, but it's going to get corrected. And so to be there to try to right the ship, for lack of a better word, is, is, is something that I consider part of the responsibility. 9.8%. Uh, Some of my staff questioned what I had done wrong, <laughs> which votes I took that, that, that caused that to happen. Uh, I, uh, Surprised it was that high? <laughs> no, I, uh, some of them, but you know, I, there, there are some must-do things that regardless of who's president, you've got to do. But I just look at the, I, just, I, I was thinking of the comparison between Senator Flake. Now, I disagree. He's a bedrock, libertarian, fiscal guy, and, uh, but he did, does and, and practices civility. Uh, deals with, we, when he was in the House, we dealt with each other as human beings and on friendly terms, and we disagreed like hell when it came time to do that. Look at that persona, and, and then look at uh, the, what we're seeing in Alabama with Moore. That's the contrast I think people in the Republican Party have to pause, or any of us have to pause and look at, that the level of what a personality is being replaced by. And I'm not, you know, that what you're doing is that you are allowing our politics to define themselves by the most extreme portions of, of, our, uh, of, of our politics. And then when we do that, that we get the Moors, you get the Kelly Wards running in Arizona, uh, who appeal to an instinct, the worst instincts. Uh, yeah, I worked with Jim Colby. We disagreed on Social Security, because he wanted to privatize part of it. We disagreed on what to do about Medicare for the long term. But we agreed when it came to uh, what we could do collectively to try to bring resources and, frankly, money to Southern Arizona in terms of transportation, education, higher ed, et cetera. Those are the way it should work. But now it's become, it's a pitch battle, and the room for compromise, uh, there's no middle ground. It's either my way or the highway. And uh, when you're in the majority and you carry that attitude, uh, when we get the majority, I think we need to correct some of the things that have been done. Um, but I don't think we should be as, not, uh, as, as punitive as these majorities have been, and understand there's going to be some areas in which we're not going to get 100 percent, 
but sometimes that turns out to be better legislation. A programming note as we wrap up this week's show. Beginning in January, Arizona Public Media will launch a new show, Arizona 360. We hope you'll join us. I'm Christopher Conover. Thanks for watching.